Where did you grow up exactly? In uh, Jamaica, Queens. I was born in Harlem, you know, and left there, uh, you know, when I was a little kid, too young to remember, and okay. moved to Queens. Okay. Now, when you were growing up in Queens, like, when did you start getting kind of mixed up with the whole street life and everything? Uh, probably around the age of 12. Okay. I would think that's uh, pretty accurate. I think I went to the uh, youth house when I was 12 years old. It was a youth detention center in the Bronx. Okay. Well, what actually got you into the, the youth uh, detention, detention uh, center? It was a, a, a drugstore, you know, a drug, little drugstore robbery that okay. we did. Armed robbery? Yeah, it was a drugstore armed robbery. Okay. You said at 12 years old? Yeah, I was with some older, you know, I was always tall for my age, plus I was okay. with some older, you know, older individuals. Okay, so at 12 years old, you started actually robbing, robbing stores. Well, was it before then? I mean, did you just get caught at 12? Did you start a little earlier? No, nah, it was about then. You know, it was about that age. And, okay. um, you know, it was a, well, it was a, like, uh, a, a, you know, between truancies and all of that, you know, then they committed me to, you know, the, the youth house and... I was later sent to, to a upstate facility for use. Okay. And when you got back, you continued to, to do crimes? Yeah. <laughs> when Pretty I much. got back. Okay. And what, what, did the, you know, what did it escalate to after that? Yeah, well, it was a progression. And, and, and um, between, uh, you know, some of the, the New York stuff, I was sent south you know to live in in tampa florida with my grandparents and uh you know between shuttling back and forth you know it's still you know kind of you know progressed into um you know more serious uh offenses okay yeah like, i mean at one point you started to actually rob banks yeah that was uh later that was when i was a little older you know i wasn't 12 when i did that but sure. i was i was a little older you know like uh Probably around 16. Yeah, oh, really? 15, 16, yeah. At 16 years old, you started robbing banks? Yeah, it might have been when I was about 15, turning 16. Okay, still a teenager? Yeah. Okay, well, what made you want to rob banks? Because that's where the money is. That's where the money was. Yeah, that's where the money was. And, you know, and plus, like, what I really felt was that, you know, at the time, you know, I came up in a, a conscious era, you know, and basically, you know, black consciousness was on the rise, you know, and black power. And uh, it was a crime that I felt wasn't against people. It was sort of against the government, you know, the, the FDIC, which is a federal insurance corporation that, you know, it, it, they, they insure the money in banks. So I really wasn't taken from no individuals, I felt. Okay. Mm. You know, I've heard, you know, because I've actually did a, an episode of American Gangster, which you were you mm. know, featured on as well. I did the, the Mac Dre episode. Right. With, uh, with Mac Dre is gang. a good friend of mine. Okay. Actually. Yeah, it was a good yeah, friend of mine. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and I know the bank robberies, sometimes you get a lot of money, sometimes you don't get very much money. Like, mm -hmm. how much did your, you know, bank robberies range in, in terms of how much you got? Well, we did takeover. See, I think that when people hear bank robberies, because, you know, they... they just think bank robbery is generally just one type of robbery. And it's not, you know, you have note passers who don't get a lot of money, you know, because they go to one teller and they pass a note. We were known as takeover bank robbers. We took over the whole entire bank and went into the vault. Oh, so, wow. you know, our, our takes usually was consistently more than the average, you know, bank robbery that's just going in there and pulling a gun on the one teller you know, like I said, it's different stages. Like, you know, you got guys that pass notes to one teller. You got guys that run in with one gun and pass a bag to a teller. You know, we took over the whole entire bank with the managers and took the managers into the vault. Okay. Like, how big was, was the crew that usually went into a, a takeover bank? Well, operator? it was usually three to four, depending on the size of the bank. You know, okay. like one or two would do the counter. One was definitely the floor man who had to stabilize the situation and, uh, you know, clock the time and let us know when it's time to get out of there. And, uh, you know, two, one or two over the tellers, depending on how long the tellers' cages were, you know, um, and one to take the, the vault. Okay. 
And and what is the the time limit for a, a takeover bank robbery for you guys? At what point? Minutes. Like, we, we can, you know, we try not to be in there more than a minute. A minute. Yeah. Sixty seconds. Sixty seconds. So so, can you explain to me that the step by step for a takeover? Uh, well. Depending on the the configuration of the bank, uh, you know, and the um, it, it depends on the configuration of the bank actually, to, you know. But the, the first man in is the floor man who controls the floor, put everybody down. Um, you know, the the next step really is the guys jump over the counters and back people back off, of, you know, back the tellers up off of the counters so they won't press the alarms. Mm -hmm. You know, and basically you assume that the alarm is going off anyway because you never know because it's silent. Yeah. You know, the only advantage we had that we had, you know, police scanners in the banks, you know, with us so we could hear, you know, the address, you know, and the robbery call for the, the bank we in. Um, and, you know, uh, one guy takes the manager or the assistant manager into the vault area. You know, so basically that was the the routine. Okay. You know. And what was your biggest take when you look at all the robberies you did? I mean, uh, we've been in, in, you know, in the 300s, you know. 300,000? Yeah, we've been up in there. Okay. What was the smallest take, you think, when you look at what you guys did? Oof. You know, sometimes, you know, depending on the the... The nervousness of the uh, well, that's one, one. Well, one of the reasons that we also did the counters was in case there was a problem with you know the system manager, or the manager. They may be too nervous to open the vault, you know. Um, you know, so we 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 would be guaranteed money by doing all the counters, you know, especially the head teller cage, and uh, so I mean, you know, fifty thousand, forty. I mean, you know. It's, at that time, it still was a good, good piece of money. You sure. Know? And was there ever any violence involved when you guys were doing it? Uh, I mean, I mean, obviously you're pulling out guns on people and telling everyone to get down. Right. But did anyone ever ever get hit, get shot, anything in else like bank? that? In the bank, no. Not in the bank. Not not in the bank. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the other times. <laughs> okay. And, and um, by the time you got caught, like how many banks uh, had you hit? Uh, um, over, you know, like I said, I started young, so that my count is, uh, you know, around uh, sixty, as they estimated. You know that that they would, I was, I was charged with sixty, but that they, you I, know, suspected me of or whatever. That's what they thought. So, what led up to your first arrest for bank robbery? Oh wow! Uh, the first arrest. The bank robbery uh, came with, uh, I think, it was a person that was, um, actually, we never got arrested in a bank. So, you know, the first really cases for, you know, uh, serious bank robberies was, it was a guy that was uh, caught doing something else and basically provided information about, you know, us, you know what I mean? Yes, because we never got, you know, we used to train for, the, you know, we used to do trainings for bank robberies and a lot of other things to prepare ourselves to be able to not be caught in the bank or to take care of any kind of confrontations that we would, you know, happen to run in. So it was basically as a result of an informant, you know, that okay. we, we got our okay. first case. So, so someone got caught for something else and they agreed to cooperate right. with the authorities to infiltrate what you guys were doing. Correct. And then testify against you. Right. And when that happened, what did you get sentenced to? Uh, the first, the first time, uh, I didn't get convicted. I got convicted for conspiracy. Okay. They couldn't get the the, the subsequent counts, and uh, my first sentences were uh, ten, ten years. The, the ten years sentence. for conspiracy. Well, it's, yeah, it was a. Um, uh, it was two conspiracies. I got ten, and then later one got thrown out, and I ended up doing the five for the one conspiracy. Okay. Uh, so you ended up doing five years, essentially. Yeah, the first federal sentence was, I ended up doing five years. Okay. But then you got out and you continued to rob banks? No. 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 I, that was it. I, I continued while I was in. 
Right. I mean, I remember hearing the story how yeah. what they they let you out on a release and you continue to to rob banks. Yeah, they let me out on a um, on a, a work study with these program that was really was a pilot program, you know, for uh, the federal system and the institution I was serving the federal sentence in was. Uh, the first of the institutions to have the pilot program. I happened to get, you know, that information prior to it coming to the facility, prior to the program coming to the facility. So I ended up preparing myself and a couple of other guys to qualify to be perfect candidates for that program. And um, when it came, we were perfect candidates among other people. And uh, we went to uh, Washington Community College and then we went to uh, Washington Community College in the evening. And then eventually we made it to the University of Michigan. In the University of Michigan, we had plenty of time on our hands. So while you were still technically in prison, you were going to college right. and robbing banks. Right. It was the best alibi in the world. Because you were still in jail. Still in prison. They're not looking for you. No. Nah. And, okay. that's where we, and we, that's where we hide out at. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, was there a reason why you decided to do that as opposed to like, okay, I got a few more years, let me just ride it out and then, then I'm out? Well, you know, part of, part of the plan was that, you know, we were going to be released to the Michigan area, you know, to finish school. That was part of the whole pilot program was to reintegrate, you know, inmates into society you know, and, you know, have them something to do positively. So we were going to be released to the Michigan area and continue to do our, pursue our college degrees. So in, in my mind, you know, uh, I, 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 my plan was to basically have enough money that I would never have to commit a crime again, you know, once I got out. And, and graduated, so I, I figured while I was still in, to accumulate that money, when okay. I come out, I don't have to do anything, just okay. go to school. So by the time you got you know, convicted for conspiracy, did you, you didn't have a ton of money put aside at that point? No, I, not, no, we was like, you know, we was spending like right. basically. You Falling know, out. Yeah, yeah, we spent money. Okay, so. So, so the plan was, okay, now that you're in, you're actually trying to stack your money up. Right, when we were then, like, basically, you know, that was just part of the plan that, you know, um, you know, once we can get out to the study release program, you know, and, it, I mean, it, it was a little, it's not just getting it, it was a, a, a lot of the planning and, and, and stuff because we had to meet people that could do our scheduling to schedule us where we could be out and, and be in classes that required only lecture hall appearances. You know, so a lot, it went, a lot went into that, you yeah. know, which, I, you know, it's just hard to put into this okay. one interview. But, um, you know, so we had to have a schedule set up that where we got out, that we got to the, the student, dropped off at the student union building, that we can go and perpetuate what we do. Okay. Right? Um, so in, in the course of those plans, like, remember, we in for years, you know, we, we was in, you know, about three years before even getting to that point. So... Um, you know, we, we met people from the area that used to come in, you know, uh, people from the Black Student Psychological Association. They used to come in once a month, you know, and other people that used to come in from the surrounding community. We was 40 miles outside of Detroit. You know, we met people from Detroit, you know. So, and then people from Detroit was in the facility, so we knew a lot of people in the area. Um, and like I said, it went, you know, we, it wasn't just like, it, cause I'm just cutting through it because you know, all of it's a long story, but you know that was initially our, you know, our plan was that we get out, we be banked up, we don't have to do nothing, we go to school, you know, get college degrees, and then invest our money. You know, in fact, during the course of the time we was out, we were looking into investing into, you know, it was a nightclub there that we was talking to some people about, you know, obtaining. So. Mm -hmm. You know. How many bank robberies did you do while you were technically in prison? Uh, well, they said six. Six bank robberies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe a couple more, though. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> they no. say, they say six. six. Okay. How did you get caught for those bank robberies? Uh, 
Uh, well, that's, that's kind of you know, a little story too. Uh, well, well, during the course of the time that we were going out, you know, one of, one of the guys, which was my co-defendant, he um, uh, kind of made friends with the, the work release driver. And, you know, basically that was because he would be the one that needed to get us back to the facility on time. So sometimes we wouldn't get back to the student union on time and he would pick us up at other locations, you know. And basically we had, by the time everything started taking form and, and we had apartments all through the town, you know, we would have other clothes, we had jewelry, we had cars. You know, we had a lot of stuff outside of the facility. And so what we would have to do, we have to go back to our apartments and change our clothes and get back into the work release clothing that they purchased for us from Montgomery Wards, which is like the equivalent of Sears yeah. and Roebuck. So uh, we would change back into those outfits to go back in. And uh, one time uh, I happened to have a, a very expensive watch on and we were kind of late. I didn't even realize it when I changed my clothes. And I was coming, I, I came back and got on the bus and he saw it and he said, yo, that watch, you know, and the guy said that he was, you know, stashing on the bus for me until the next day. I had no choice but to trust him for it. And I did that. So one of my other co-defendants thought that, that he could be trusted, you know, beyond that point. And he couldn't actually, but he did. And, um, you know, we had met his brother. His brother was from Detroit, and, you know, he was supposed to be into the street life world deep. And he had did some things for us, and um, basically it was a car. Make a long story short, because it's a big story. And it was a car that was involved that the brother had given us, or had given his brother, and one, one it was used, not in the bank robbery, but it was used to to steal a car that was going to be used in a bank robbery. And that particular car was, when, that, when the, the car theft was going on, the plate number was taken down of the, the good car that we had. And um, they eventually came, you know, through their investigation, eventually ended up coming to the facility to, to question the brother because his brother, when they went to him, his brother said, oh, the, my car, my brother had my car and told him where he was at. When they eventually came to him, you know, he basically said that, oh, that car was used on that particular day by, you know, these individuals and, and I do know other information on them about their apartments and stuff that they have. So, so that's how it kind of- Unraveled. Unraveled, yeah. You now have this. Was it was it a federal penitentiary that you federal were at? Federal penitentiary. Yeah. You now Mild have Michigan. The, Michigan. The warden of a federal penitentiary that set up this this wonderfully progressive, you know, school program, only to have the inmates go and rob more banks in the process. Right. It was uh, very embarrassing for. Very embarrassing for the warden. For the Bureau of Prisons. And, yeah, the Bureau of Prisons yeah. overall. Right. What 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 was the what was the get back? <laughs> okay, yeah, it was okay. So first, uh, when they when they come, you know kind of came and got us, they uh, put us first. They put us in three uh, separate jails in, in throughout Michigan, and um, you know first they put us in you know solitary confinement. Then they took us and put us in three separate jails, and then they took us to court and arraigned us on the uh, the bank robbery charges. Um, but prior to the first hearing, uh, the work release driver said that he had a change of heart. And that was one of their main, you know, witnesses to tie us to anything, you know. And he said some guys came to visit him and that he had a change of heart. And, you know, his testimony, he would not testify. So uh, approximately, I guess that the hearing was like probably 21 days or so, 20 days or so after, the, after we were first arraigned and they dismissed the charges at the hearing. So now when they dismissed the charges, they took us and put us at the time what they call the merry-go-round. 
And on that, all they do is put you in a, a car, a marshal vehicles, and they just ride you all over the country and, and drop you off at different jails all over the country, different holding, federal holding places, and which were in different, you know, county jails. So they would ride us, you know, and drop us for three days and come pick us up, take us to another, so we would never be stable. We never could call anybody. You know, we would remain in the lockup of the jail. And they, they did us, had us on a merry-go-round um, for probably about, I guess, about three months. You know, and then we had to kind of take, start taking some action to kind of get out of that. So we would, you know, buck, we would refuse to go into the jails when we get there, we refuse the process. We refuse the fingerprint, take any picture, you know, they, with no mug shots, no nothing. And, uh, you know, cause, we would cause a problem at the jail, basically. And um, then when the marshals come get us, we refuse to go, so they would have to, you know, wrestle with us to cuff us up and put us in the car. So eventually they put us in uh, Lewisburg Penitentiary, in the hole in Lewisburg Penitentiary, solitary confinement. And we stayed in there for about another four months in, in solitary confinement. And then they put us in Lewisburg population at the penitentiary. And then eventually we, we made parole. Okay. We got out. Oh, I'm maxed out. You maxed out. And how long mm -hmm. were you in there? Yeah. Total time well, by the time you got out? Probably five, uh, five years. We had, we had four and chains. You know? So you never really. I lost my, all my good time and all that. You know? <laughs> right. So yeah, I did. But, I but, maxed it out. But you technically didn't get any new time for the new bank no, robberies. No, not, not, not then. They eventually came back. They eventually came back. Some, you know, some, you know, because the statute of limitations is five years. Yeah. Yeah, they eventually came back with that case. I mean, we, you know, the guy that I'm talking about, his name is uh, Jeffrey Rockman. Uh, Jeffrey Rockman eventually, you know, cooperated. I don't know if he got in trouble again or what possessed him to cooperate later. But he agreed to cooperate and go into the witness protection program. And I think it was just starting at that time, you know, the, the real one that they got now that they use. And um, he agreed to go into that, you know, to get his name changed and all of that. And he went to the grand jury and we got, later got indicted for that bank, for one of the bank robberies. Okay. And how many more years did you get for that? 25. 25 years. Yeah. So then you got sentenced to 25 years for one bank robbery. Right. And how long did you have to serve out? Well. You got convicted for that? Yeah, I got convicted for that. And you were given 25 years? I was given 25 years. And how long did you have to serve? Two weeks. I escaped. <laughs> <laughs> you escaped after two weeks? Yeah, I had a, a attempt murder of, uh, I had attempt murder of two police officers, so they say. And, um. I was I was going to court for that. I had they brought me back to the Queen's House of Detention to to you know go on trial for that, and um, I uh, got hold of a uh, an inmate that was doing seven days, and you know for you know some I don't even know what he was doing it for basically, but I know he had seven days and he was uh, you know some some you know smaller smaller offense or whatever he was sentenced to, and. Uh, when it, when it got overcrowded, they, they would place, you know, those kind of individuals near where the maximum security wing was. And, you know, um, the day he was supposed to go out, I went out in his place. Okay. You know, so I basically walked out of there and, you know, as him. And he later went downstairs after I was gone and, and, and just said he didn't, you know, he, he's there for release. And basically, uh, the, the, the alarms went off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically the alarms went off and then they eventually let him go that day because he, he didn't cooperate and do it. He, he basically didn't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> so, so you essentially threatened him? Well, Something I, like that. I, I left early that morning. <laughs> okay. All right. So you, so you escaped. Yeah. And then, but you're still... What happened to the 25 years? I still had it. I was on, I was on the, uh, the most wanted list for, you know, the FBI most wanted, the U.S. Marshals most wanted, and New York, 
New York State and New York City most wanted list. I was on the run. For how long? Point. Uh, I was out for some months, actually. I didn't get a year out, you know, but because I was working basically again, you know, yeah. Robbing banks again? I was back at it. Back at yeah, it. Back at it. Hard, harder than I was before. Okay. Yeah. And how, but you eventually, eventually got caught. I, yeah, I eventually got caught going to a, a stash house in, in, in New York. It was a robbery that, uh, in, it was a bank that we had targeted in Monticello, New York. You know, because it was around the racetrack, and basically, uh, um, we, uh, I came back to New York for that. But somehow, it was a, it was another informant lurking somewhere that got that information. And but the information that he provided uh, to the to the police was that I was coming back to 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 retaliate on the police officer that arrested me for the state case. You know, because it, it, that was a shootout with two guys that got shot, two of uh, our guys that got shot. And, you know, they, they beat me up pretty badly and broke my nose. So somehow the information was translated that I was back to, you know, seek revenge. And I think with the, um, you know, with the history of my family, some of my family history and that, you know, as being, you know, or more on the militant side, you know, the resistance side, you know, of the 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 civil rights movement, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, then they, it was believable, you know, in their minds. And uh, they was at one of the safe houses when I they stayed there for two days, you know, when they heard I was coming there. And that's how it was a shootout. And then they captured me. Okay. So there was a shootout. Mm. You got captured. Yeah. Again. I got hit. You know, I got a graze. It wasn't even. Okay. You went to court mm. and you were sentenced to how long? At that time, uh, I got another, well, I had the 25. And uh, before I got to that, that particular thing, I was just captured. So the first trial I had after that was the trial for the state case for the attempt to murder the two police officers. And I was sentenced, I got found guilty, and I was sentenced to 25 years consecutive to the 25 that I had okay. originally for the Michigan case. And um, so that was 50 at that point, you know. 50 years. Yeah, and then. And then I went to trial on the additional robberies that happened while on escape, because I was later charged with that, you know. Um, Actually, a guy, uh, while I was in, it's alleged that, you know, I was sending orders out to guys that were with my crew to rob banks, you know, to pay for my defense, to pay for my lawyer fees and all that. And um, the Monticello Bank that I never got to get to, they went to rob that bank. And uh, once... Uh, they were in that bank, so they got, they got away with it, but somehow the, the switch went bad. And a police chief in the town happened to be riding by and saw the suspicious switch up. And, you know, the bank robbery came over to, I guess, his, his uh, scanner, and then he gave pursuit and, you know, asked for, you know, help and assistance, and they were captured after, you know, high-speed chase. Um, after that, one of the guys, a guy by the name of Curtis King, he contacted the FBI and said he had information on me, which I was very known to the FBI at that point. And he said that he had information on me and bank robberies, you know, that I've done all across the country. And so he went into the witness protection program. And so I was charged at that point with the additional robberies that, that happened while I was on escape. And, and after that, uh, I went to trial again, was found guilty, and I got another 45 years, you know, another 25 and another 20, which is 45 running consecutive and running consecutive to what I had already. So that, that came up to 95 years between the, all the sentences I got. Nine, so you, you've been sentenced to 95 years? Yeah. But it was all consecutive? Right, right. Which, which meant? 25 year sentences and a 20 year sentence running consecutive. So it's really 25 years. No, no. It's, it, not until they, it, it eventually became 
running concurrent. Concurrent. Oh, oh, right. oh okay. Consecutive concurrent. Consecutive, yeah. right. Is right, one after the right. other. Concurrent. Sorry, yes. I misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Okay. How long out of those 95 years did you end up serving? Well, again, like you said, it eventually, you know, one sentence was stolen out because it was illegal. Another couple of sentences were uh, ran concurrently. So by the time everything was run concurrent, I served 15, I was under the old law, the old federal law, I served 15 years and then was released on parole supervision. How old were you when you got out after that, that 15 year sentence? How old was I? Uh, I was, uh, what was it, 39, 38, or something like that. I, I, let me do the math on that. Yeah, I was in my late 30s, Okay, almost actually. Late 30s. Yeah. Okay. So you get out in your late 30s. Mm -hmm. When did you, at that point, did you say, okay, no more bank robberies, I got to go do something else? Yeah, at that point I had actually, uh, while I was, that's one of the reasons I got Parole, like I believe, is because you know what the stuff that I was doing while I was incarcerated, and I was kind of preparing myself for the release. You know, I earned two, you know, bachelor's degrees, you know, and numerous other stuff in some programming, and you know that went well with the parole, you know, with the parole board and with the facility that I was in, and I neighbor, you know, the recommendations went in, you know, because my stuff had to be approved in Washington, and I was eventually paroled, so. When I came out, though, I was uh, still under what they call intensive supervision, you know, because basically if you have a certain amount of time or done a certain amount of time or you're organized crime or something like that, you know, your case is big, they put you with these special parole officers whose job is really not to keep you out but to get you back as soon as possible, okay. you know. And uh, so I had to figure out a way to uh, not allow them to do that and you know it's like a catch-22 they tell you as a condition of your parole that you had to be gainfully employed you know so when you report in whether it's every week or every two weeks you got to tell them that you or show them that you have been running around looking for jobs and you give them they always ask you uh, oh yeah so where, you, where did you go you know and then they'll go verify that when they go verify it depending on who you are you know they'll come with their Bads hanging out with their flak jackets on and ask the guy, did he interview you or did you apply for the job? So you know you wasn't going to get the job. So basically, <laughs> I, I had to figure a way around that. So I said I had to get into my own business. And that way, you know, I could, you know, avoid those pitfalls, you know. So uh, my, my uh, son was actually working with, like, as a roadie for uh, Naughty by Nature. And one day, you know, he, I was in the, in the house and he had, I looked at his itinerary for the tour. And when I looked at the itinerary for the tour, he had, I saw the cities that they were doing. And I knew people in all of those cities, basically, from my incarceration. I was incarceration in the federal prison system. And, you know, people from all over the country there. And I made a lot of friends and while I was in there in a lot of states. And, you know, a lot of us kept in touch with each other, you know, you know, or if you ever get out, holler at me or whatever, whatever. Yeah. So I started calling some of them guys that were, that I saw in different cities on that tour and asking them about the clubs in, in the city, you know, the you know, clubs, the, uh, uh, you know, security, people that do security, you know, who does promotions, street teams. And basically I, I went back to, uh, uh, actually KG's brother and made it cut a deal to do the after parties for all of their uh, the cities that, that were on the itinerary, the official after parties and that's how I basically started.